I am not an easy guy to live with. I'm moody at times, I'm told. Uh, uh, but rarely. <laughs> I'm just doing some gardening after filming this video. Just, you know, I'm planting okra. If I'm out in the garden, you must pardon. <laughs> Oj Simlin, O G O G Simlin, O Orenthal James Simpson. By now we all know what he did. The trial is yeah that's been talked about a lot. No need to go there again. Today I want to talk about everything that came before it because this psycho flew 40 years worth of red flags that too many people ignored. So we're going to get into the lesser discussed aspects of OJ and answer popular questions like did he have a horrible childhood like a lot of killers do? Was he married before Nicole? Did he have something traumatic happen to him when he was younger? How turbulent was his marriage with Nicole? Did he have a brain injury from playing football? And what did he do beforehand that helped him get away with it? <laughs> Ornamental Jim Smithsonian grew up in the Potrero Hill area of San Francisco. Uh, it's, it went through gentrification in the late 90s, so now it's considered a very wealthy and upscale, upscale kind of neighborhood. You know, they've got Victorian houses and condos that look like they should be a science museum. You know, they got very pretentious craft beer breweries like, you know, Xylophone Zebra IPA. I don't know, I just made that up. But before that, especially in the 1950s and 60s, it was a very impoverished neighborhood. Pretty much from the beginning, Ornament Simmons' life was bad. It wasn't good at all. He developed rickets at the age of four, which if you don't know what rickets are, it's malnourishment, basically. You don't get enough vitamin D to your body. Your bones are brittle. They're basically paper mache. So he had to wear homemade leg braces for the first several years of his life. His parents divorced when he was just four years old. So he and a brother and two sisters were raised by his mother in the housing projects. He didn't have a present father in the house for pretty much his entire childhood. And the only time he would ever get strict discipline from his father was when his mom was really desperate for help. So she would just call him up and be like, please help. And of course, if the only time you ever really interact with your dad is if he's screaming at you, little fellas are gonna start getting into some trouble. Oh boy, oh boy. So at the age of 13, he joined a gang called the Persian Warriors. They were actually known to not be violent. They, they believed in community and creating a sense of belonging, which I didn't know gangs did that. They did do some stealing. There was a story out there about orange juice and the gang stealing liquor and getting hammered. They were probably trying to get some ingredients to make a screwdriver. Orange vodka juice, cop. But for the most part, they were just, you know, hanging out. And for someone like young Tropicana, who was desperately searching for identity, for a while, this was the perfect fit, un unlike the glove. But it wasn't long after when he joined an actual violent gang and that started his life of brutality. In a 1976 interview, he said, I never infringed on people. I only beat up dudes who deserved it, at least once a week, usually on Friday or Saturday night. If there weren't no fight, it wasn't no weekend. I am more nervous than a lobster in a river full of rubber bands. He was like a young Dexter, you know, uh, well, according to him, I don't think anyone was thinking that except for him. Despite his self-proclaimed heroism, his old high school buddy, Joe Bell, didn't quite agree with that statement. In an ESPN interview, he said he was a great guy, but he wasn't any angel. If circumstances had just been slightly tilted instead of a football star, he could have been public enemy number one. Oh, hey, guy! So one fight landed him in the Youth Guidance Center, and that's when his family started getting really worried, and they knew they had to do something. So his uncle called up somebody at the Guidance Center who knew baseball legend Willie Mays. And essentially, they just reached out to him and were like, hey, we've got this really talented, gifted athlete, and he's going to be something, but he's a knucklehead. Please talk to him. We're, we're out of ideas. So one day Willie just shows up to his house and he let OJ hang out with him for a while. You know, he took him to the cleaners. He took him to the grocery store. He let him see his new truck. And he was like, hey, what do you think? What, should I put some um, rims on it? Should I put some nice rims? How about a, a new grill? Uh, what about those lights that sit on top of a truck and like just blind everybody? And he didn't give him advice or anything. He just kind of showed him around and just let him know that he was a normal human being. He basically tried to show him that his life was achievable. You know, for somebody like OJ, who came from kind of nothing, he 
probably didn't have a real sense of, oh, I can do this. And I think Willie Mays knew that. So he was like, I'm just going to show him I'm just a normal human being like anyone else. And you can do this. Uh, after that, he left San Francisco and went down to UCLA, I guess. But I feel right now in talking to him, those couple of hours, I helped him a great deal. So from then on, Juicy Simpleton went for it. And from a football standpoint, it turned out pretty well. But the red flags had already been planted into the ground. <laughs> So a lot of people don't know this, but O.J. Simpson was actually married before he met Nicole. He was married to his high school sweetheart named Marguerite Whitley. They had three children together. Fun fact, when he met her, she was actually dating A.C. Cowlings. Yes, the dude who was with him in the white Ford Bronco in the infamous police chase. O.J. and Marguerite were married for 12 years, and then O.J. met Nicole in 1977 and had an affair. Marguerite found out about it in 1978, immediately divorced him, they were officially divorced in 1979. Oh, male constituent! And there were a few noteworthy things that happened during this time. Uh, for one, OJ's daughter, Erin, drowned in Marguerite's mother's swimming pool at the age of two. Now, of course, you're probably thinking, but based on the timeline of events, it does not seem like he was involved in any way because he and Marguerite were already divorced at that time and he was not present in the house. Marguerite found Aaron in the pool unconscious, immediately dialed 911, rushed her to the emergency room where she was for 10 days and she was put in a coma and then eventually passed away from respiratory issues. It very much seemed like an accidental tragedy. And at the time, OJ was already a star in the NFL who had come from nothing. He had finally made it and then he had this happen. So you can only imagine how this could potentially change someone, especially a person with already violent tendencies. In 2004, OJ did an interview with NBC Today with Katie Couric. He said that his ex-wife and him never talked about the drowning, not once. During the line of questioning, he immediately shut down and said, you know, I don't want to discuss it. For one, that's a very stark difference from how he reacted to Nicole's death because as you all know, he would, anytime Nicole was mentioned, he would start laughing hysterically. <laughs> this is not I'm right, sorry. Right. I know we got to back up again. <laughs> but I think that also shows just how much his daughter's death affected him negatively. For the most part, Marguerite has purposely kept out of the public eye. There were no official reports of physical violence. She did claim that they were both immature when they were married and they both pushed each other to their limits, but uh, that's really about it. However, OJ did speak out against her in official court documents from when they were divorced. He claimed that Marguerite threatened him with physical abuse, libel, and slander. Why? Because he refused to leave the house after they separated. <laughs> <laughs> But despite this, Marguerite showed up to trial in support of OJ. She insisted that he wasn't capable of doing something like this, and she also claimed that he had a very good relationship with his children. I don't know about that one, madam! There was a claim made by former LAPD officer Jim King that she did make a domestic violence call in the 70s. Jim said that she called and insisted that he punched, choked, and pushed her to the ground, but Marguerite has always denied this. Nevertheless, I do think his daughter's tragic death played a huge part in how he treated Nicole because at this point, everyone he loved was leaving him. His parents separated and his dad left and was never around. Marguerite left him. Then his daughter passed away. And I think this is what really kicked in his obsessive, controlling, you know, you can't leave kind of behavior that we really saw in Nicole's relationship which with him. Which means anything can happen. You know, which means anything can happen. And and uh, I think that adds to the excitement of the play. I think you'd be very pleased to yeah, see Speaking it. of that lady I was talking about. Yeah, she is. With another shot of this tequila. Now watch her, yeah, I'm just ready. So watch her sing. Well, no, sing. No, no, she oh can sing some <laughs> That's live. That's live. <laughs> We're alive right now, all across America. That she is my woman. No. <laughs> I'm taking her tequila. That's why I'm not singing tonight. Now in the years leading up to the murder, the red flags really started to show themselves. Alert! Alert! <laughs> it all kind of started in 1985, about nine years before Nicole's death. The timeline has been very well documented, in large part to Nicole herself, because she incessantly called the police on him, and she kept a very detailed diary with over 60 entries that corroborated the timeline of events and gave a ton of credibility to her story. There were several visits by police to the Simpson residence, um, that continued into 1986. There was one instance in 1985 where OJ shattered Nicole's windshield with a baseball bat. And weirdly enough, the man who responded to the call was Detective Mark Furman, the man 
who was the lead detective in the murder case. So he was involved with them almost 10 years beforehand. According to the report, he said OJ was smashing Nicole's whole entire Mercedes car and Nicole was on top of it screaming. OJ apparently refused to stop hitting the car and Mark was forced to pull out his baton, but Nicole refused to press charges. I think I remember reading about something where he said like, are you sure? Like, you sure you don't want to press charges? And she was very insistent on not pressing charges. And he said, end quote, well, it's your life. And Mark claims that that quote kind of rings in his head. In 1989, OJ was arrested because he beat Nicole so badly that she had to be hospitalized. In this incident, he specifically said out loud, I'm gonna kill you. Despite that, he pleaded no contest. He paid a small fee. And I think he had to do like 120 hours of community service. That's it. Prior to this arrest, Nicole called the police on him a total of eight times. So at this point, nine times in four years. Nicole officially filed for divorce in 1992 after seven years of marriage, but this really only ramped up OJ's strange behavior. That same year, Nicole told her mother that OJ was obsessively following her. I go to the gas station, he's there. I go to the Payless shoe store, he's there. I'm driving and he's behind me. The only thing you should be following is the law, pal! And this led to one of the most infamous 911 calls in American history, where Nicole dialed the police because OJ Simpson was in her front yard trying to break into the house. I'm not playing the call, it's disturbing. I don't want to hear it. I haven't heard it. Don't want to. And I'm sure you don't want it either because it's it's that bad. But she was literally on the phone with police as he broke in and she was crying. Despite that, he pleaded no contest again and all prosecutors could get out of it was mandatory counseling over the phone. This time he got even less punishment, which is just uh, so, so backwards. It's so backwards. It actually got so bad that Nicole stored items inside a deposit box at the bank that police found six months after her death because she knew it was possible that OJ could kill her at some point. So she wanted to provide police with evidence that he had been doing everything that she said he had been doing. The deposit box included photos of her bruised and swollen face, apology letters from OJ where he admitted to the abuse, a detailed journal that tracked his stalking behavior, and newspaper clips from the 1989 incident. So everything was there. There was an entire decade of incidents and no one really did anything. And this kind of bled over into his next relationship when he got together with a 21 year old when he was 49. Her name was Christy Prody and they dated for 13 years. She went on Good Morning America about 15 years ago and claimed that he was really verbally and physically abusive and demanded that she wear her hair and dress the same way as Nicole. And if you look at the photos, you'll see that this is true. I mean, they look like the same, I wouldn't be able to tell them apart. If you just lined them up and said, which one's which, I insert Pam from the office meme where she says, they're the same picture. They're the same picture. And I think that might've partially been why Nicole stayed with him for so long because there was that obsession there. You know, I'm sure the main reason was the fear aspect. Like, oh my God, this is a former football player. I'm sure that was a prevailing concern, but there was that obsession there. You did try to leave him. Oh, absolutely. Um, Several times. What happened when you tried to do that? He would find me. I, I couldn't leave. I didn't have anywhere to go. And I'm sure he was able to portray that as love for a very long time. People like him are experts of manipulation and deception. And we'll get into how he mastered this in here in a minute. It's easy to forget, but at one time, Oreo Simon was a really good football player. He was like a really good, like a just like the best. He won the Heisman Trophy with USC in college and was then taken number one overall in the NFL draft by the Buffalo Bills. He earned five Pro Bowl selections. He was the NFL MVP one year. He rushed for over 11,000 yards. He eventually got to the NFL Hall of Fame. I know many of you may not follow football, so let me put it this way. Way. He was like Miley Cyrus of the gridiron. He wasn't Taylor Swift, who was dominating all the headlines all the time, always. But he was a legend. You thought he was a killer in the neighborhood. He was an assassin in the stadium. But as we know with football, there come head injuries, especially with a, a dual threat running back like that, who's just constantly getting the football way more than the average player. And especially back then in the 60s and 70s, because at that time, nobody really knew what concussions were. Did you have any idea that it was going to have an effect on your brain? No. No, nobody ever mentioned the brain. I mean, everybody knows you're going to have bad knees, bad shoulders, but nobody ever mentioned the brain to, you know, to anybody. And it, it was more of a badge of honor to play through extreme pain. It was like almost encouraged. I am more overwhelmed than a trout trap than a tackle box. I watched a lot of ESPN Classic when I was growing up, like especially when I was nine, I was watching a lot of games from the 60s like game replays, these players could suddenly be able to spin their head around like a fucking owl, like, and just projectile vomit as they're doing it. And coaches would be like, yep, yeah, mm -hmm, it's good for you. Keep it up. They'll spin their head form and just 
spin it like a top like the inception top they just and because of this orange juice doesn't have a long list of documented concussions people who have been especially outspoken about their suspicions of cte based on oj's behavior if you don't know anything about it it causes horrible decision making impulsivity short-term memory loss you know aggressiveness migraines confusion just all of the things that oval siphon was known for Back in 2017, pathologist Dr. Bennett Omalu, who is renowned for his leading research in studying the effects of repeated concussions to the brain, he did a thorough study of OJ and claimed that he was willing to bet his medical license that OJ had CTE. He said one of the leading reasons was his abnormally large noggin. Apparently, neck strength reduces the risk of concussion, but when you've got a dang colossal cranium like Mr. Orantholomew Jimothy Samsonite, you're going to wear that neck down and you're going to have some problems. The second account comes from a former retired guard named Jeffrey Felix. He spent every day with OJ when he was imprisoned in 2008 for stealing sports memorabilia at gunpoint. He'd wake up in the morning wondering what time his tea time was for golf and he's in a prison. He also claimed that OJ would regularly forget to take medication, eat dinner, and regularly suffered from migraines. Perhaps the most interesting account came from his ex-manager Norman Pardo. Norman traveled around the country with him and experienced several unhinged rants, as he put it. OJ wasn't right in the head, Pardo claimed. He would talk to himself in the car and then he'd argue with himself in the car. Sometimes he'd talk like he was talking in third person. Somebody should have gotten this man a weekly pill organizer! They're like seven dollars on Amazon! By the way, this is absolutely not an excuse for what OJ did. There's plenty of people out there who have CTE, extreme CTE and they don't go around often people. This just kind of provides a reason why he had a whole lot of missing marbles. This is currently a terrifyingly common issue with the NFL right now because there's a lot of research coming out about CTE and traumatic brain injuries and there's just a lot of former NFL players who are not doing well. In 2023, the Boston CTE Center examined 345 former NFL players brains and 91% of them were diagnosed with CTE, 90, 91. And in 2016, a lawsuit from a bunch of former players was settled where the NFL now has to pay up to $5 million for each retired player if they have repeated medical problems related to head injuries. That's how, that's how bad it's gotten. And I think this comes off the back of several former players who have recently committed suicide. There's Junior Seau, there's Jovan Belcher. He killed his girlfriend, then showed up to Arrowhead Stadium, where the Kansas City Chiefs play, pointed a gun at his head in front of the GM and the head coach, Romeo Cornell, and offed himself. These players had CTE. And most notably, Aaron Hernandez, who a lot of you know from the Netflix documentary, he infamously killed Odin Lloyd and then killed himself in prison. His brain was analyzed after his death, and researchers found that his brain was so deteriorated that he had the brain of a 50-year-old man, essentially. It is the most advanced case of CTE in the history of the injury. That's how prevalent CTE has become in OJ's world. It would honestly be more shocking that he didn't have CTE. So after all this shit, after all the red flags, the complaints, the erratic behavior, the just how the hell did he get away with murdering Nicole and Ron Goldman? Well, we know about the glove. We know about the detective handling the case, Mark Furman. He had a history of making racist remarks. We know OJ's lawyer, Johnny Cochran, accused Furman of planting OJ's blood at the crime scene, which of course was never proved. Uh, we know OJ was rich and famous. We know the jury had a lot of doubts due to the police's mishandling of evidence. And we know this trial happened shortly after the Rodney King case and the 1992 riots. So that combination actually created a solid enough defense because for those who believed OJ, this was just a successful wealthy black man that, you know, everyone was trying to tear down. But what many people don't remember is how squeaky clean of an image he had managed to make for himself before he met Nicole. He made a deliberate effort to distance himself from his past and create this new image, and it worked. And many people say it's, you know, the money and the fame and just, but a big part of it was his charisma and this public persona that he put on. And in my humble, nobody opinion, I think what he took away from Willie Mays the most was Willie's personality. He's even said in interviews that Willie Mays was his idol. You know, people talk about Willie Mays, and when they talk about him, there was smiles, there was good feelings. You know, my uncle, I had an uncle who used to drink all the time. He was whining over, but he's a good man. Uh, he, uh, 
you know, you talk about say, hey, Willie Mays, you know, and I noticed he felt good and proud, you know, so I went out to see this man play. And I felt good and proud, you know, and it's like, hey, I was Willie Mays. Before, O.J. was seen as this rugged troublemaker from a bad neighborhood, but by the mid-80s, after his playing career was over, the whole country viewed him as a remade man. His charisma and intelligence were off the charts, and he, he kind of had this, like, Obama energy about him. And it allowed him to get into broadcasting, starring in movies and TV shows. And it's hard to believe it now, but before the murder trial, he was one of the most well-liked athletes in the country. And that is a picture of you looking at exhibit one, correct? It appears to be me, yes. Okay. And the jacket you're wearing, could you describe it? No. Do you remember owning that jacket? No. Do you remember wearing that jacket? Before this case happened, the whole country just kind of saw domestic disputes as a private matter. Everyone was just like, hey, th that's your business. I'm not, I don't want a part of it. I don't want to talk about it. But Nicole's death completely changed how domestic violence was viewed not just by the general public, but also, you know, cops, politicians started looking at domestic violence differently. It changed laws. It created an unprecedented amount of donations to battered women's shelters. People started paying attention to the red flags more than ever. And they started talking about it just like I'm doing right now. Now, I don't think anything good came from the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. I think if we all had the choice, we would prefer that they would still be alive today. But if there's anything to take from it, we are not nearly as hesitant to notice these warning signs and say something about it. And I do think that's productive. So rest in peace, Nicole Brown Simpson, rest in peace, Ron Goldman, OJ Simpson, I, I don't care about you, fuck you. Now I assume after this video, you will need a restoration in your faith in humanity. So click the top left and watch Reddit stories that will make you cry.